Um, our final speaker is Dr. Steve Taylor, and Steve is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University and the author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality. His books have been published in 20 languages and his articles and essays have been published in academic journals, magazines, newspapers. He regularly appears in the media in the UK. Um, including on Radio 5 Live and Talk Radio. He writes blog articles for Scientific American and for Psychology Today. And he has given numerous lectures, some of which are available online, which is how um, I found him for today. Steve and I had never met before today, but when I saw him, his lectures, I thought he has to be part of this symposium. So Steve is going to introduce a philosophical approach in his talk that he likes to call pan-spiritism. Um, he will summarize the fundamental principles and discuss how it links, links to earlier and mostly Eastern philosophical perspectives and how it differs from other perspectives. Um, so I will leave it at that and let you tell us yourself, Steve. The floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm muted. I'm unmuted now. Yes. Uh, I was just saying you, you're doing quite well without me. You could have carried on. <laughs> But um, yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's great to be part of this uh, stimulating conference. My, my whole presentation is going to consist of uh, metaphysical challenges, I think, because it's probably the most uh, metaphysical presentation um, of the day, of the afternoon. Um, but in, in a way, it carries on from uh, Bernardo's presentation this uh, earlier, because I agree with Bernardo that um, I don't think consciousness can be explained purely in terms of brain activity. Um, so I, I think, you know, physicalism has failed uh, as, a, as, a, as in an attempt to explain consciousness. And I think physicalism has, has failed in many ways as well. I don't think physicalism can explain um, altruism, for example. I don't think physicalism, any physicalist approach can explain the influence of the mind over the body as, um, you know, as in the placebo or nocebo effects. I don't even think physicalism can explain evolution. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, I think 20 years ago, neo-Darwinism was like the, the standard view of evolution that was every rational person was supposed to accept. But I think uh, there's been a lot of doubt about neo-Darwinism over the past 10 years. And I think more and more biologists are beginning to think beyond neo-Darwinism. So I think physicalism doesn't really offer a coherent explanation of the world or of human experience. It certainly can explain things like near-death experiences, um, spiritual experiences or mystical experiences. And it certainly can explain psi experiences of precognition. So we need another metaphysical approach to replace physicalism. We need an, we need an alternative to physicalism. And um, Bernardo suggested um, his own approach of analytic idealism. There are obviously other approaches too. Um, at the moment, you're probably aware that panpsychism is becoming quite popular. Um, there are other approaches to varieties of idealism dual aspect monism. I think a lot of people, a lot of intellectuals and philosophers are looking for alternative approaches to physicalism. So it's really a question of finding the most coherent and you know, the approach with the most explanatory power that has the most kind of theoretical coherence and which can integrate a variety of different forms of phenomena. So I'm gonna present my own, um, my own kind of metaphysical alternative to physicalism. Um, it's got, obviously it has similarities to other approaches. Um, the name suggests a similarity to panpsychism, but there's a fundamental difference in that panpsychism suggests that consciousness is present or is inherent within matter, within material particles. But I don't think that goes far enough. Um, I think consciousness is actually present in all space. I think consciousness is not just present within matter. It's present within all space. Uh, it was maybe even the source of all material things. And I think consciousness is the essence of, of all living entities as well. It constitutes the essence of our own being. So I'm going to explain some of the basic principles of conspiritism, and I'm going to explain um, some of the ways in which it can help to explain human experience and the way the world works. But I've, I've pondered over this. I think in some ways, the best way to illustrate panspiritism is to actually, um, is to actually experience what it means through a meditative exercise. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take you through a brief meditative type exercise, just for a few minutes to illustrate what I mean by panspiritism. This will probably take no longer than uh, three or four minutes. And it's a good way of illustrating the basic principles of my approach. <laughs> 
So I'd just like you to close your eyes for a moment and uh, maybe just um, for a moment, just bring your attention to your, to your breathing. Just be aware of the, the air brushing the inside of your nose for a moment. Be aware of how your stomach rises and falls with your breath. And now I'd like you to, for a moment, bring your attention outside your body and your mind. And I'd like you to visualize that consciousness is not something that is produced by your brain, but it's something which is everywhere around you. It pervades the space around you. It pervades the air around you. It pervades the whole of the Earth's atmosphere and the whole of space. And you can feel that consciousness has a dynamic quality, a kind of radiant dynamic quality, which you can feel in the air around you, in the space around you. And I'd like you to visualize how this consciousness which is around you enters into your individual being and becomes your own consciousness and it does that through primarily through your brain so just imagine that your brain is like a radio which is receiving this consciousness which is around you and which transmits this consciousness into your own individual being and you can feel that process taking place you can feel your brain picking up or receiving this consciousness and channeling it into your individual being so you can feel consciousness continually flowing into you from the outside through your brain. Just like water flowing through a fountain. So maybe you can just be aware of that process for a few minutes, consciousness flowing or streaming into your individual being. But it doesn't just happen through your brain. That's the primary place. It, it also happens through every cell in your body. You can feel consciousness entering into your being through every cell in your body. Down below your head into your lower body, into your chest, down into your legs. And you can feel this as your life energy, which is sometimes called chi in Taoist philosophy, the inner energy of your body. You can feel this inner energy entering into you through the cells of your body and becoming your inner being. And at the same time, as well as streaming into your own inner being, you're aware that this fundamental consciousness is streaming into the inner beings of all other human beings. The same essence which constitutes your being is also streaming into them and becoming the essence of their being. So that we're all channels of this fundamental consciousness. And so when other people experience pain or suffering or even joy, we can sense it because we share 
the same essential being as them. And that applies to all life forms, all living beings. The same essential consciousness is streaming into them. And that creates a sense of connection between us and all other living beings. So just for a moment, maybe you can ex experience or sense that connection you have between or with all of the human beings and all of the, all of the living beings with the same essential consciousness flowing into you and all of them. And now let's bring our attention back to our own mental space, our own inner being. Just be aware of your body again. Be aware of your breathing again. And let's slowly open our eyes again. Thank you. So that was uh, hopefully a way of illustrating what I mean by panspiritism. And I'll go through some of the principles of the approach now in a more formal way. Um, it's based on a recent book of mine called Spiritual Science. But it's a, it's a new approach. It's an approach I'm still developing. So it's quite speculative, admittedly. And but as time goes by, I'm, I'm um, filling, in, filling in more of the details. So these are the essential principles. So the essential idea is that consciousness is fundamental to the universe. It's not just produced by the brain. It exists fundamentally beyond the brain. There are, there are many philosophers and scientists who have a similar approach. Like David Chalmers, for example, believes that consciousness is fundamental and universal. But David Chalmers believes that consciousness is um, you know, equivalent to one of the fundamental principles of the universe, like gravity or mass. But I think consciousness may be even more fundamental than that. I think it may be the actual source of the universe. In other words, it didn't come into being with the universe. It actually existed before the universe and it gave rise to the universe. So I'm suggesting that fundamental consciousness, as I call it, gave rise to material particles and material particles collected together in more, more and more complex forms. And eventually that led to living beings. You could call fundamental consciousness spirit. It's essentially the same thing. It depends who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a kind of spiritual audience, I'll, I'll, I'm more likely to use the term spirit. But if I'm talking to a, a more academic audience, um, I'm more likely to use the term fundamental consciousness. Otherwise, I may be ejected from the uh, auditorium. But one of the important ideas is that fundamental consciousness constitutes our own being. It constitutes the being of every living, um, living entity. And that happens through the brain, as I've suggested in that meditative, meditative exercise. In other words, the brain is like a, like a radio that transmits and receives, receives and transmits fundamental consciousness. But importantly, it's not just the brain. It's every cell in our body. The brain is the most kind of complex cellular structure within the body. So that is the center of consciousness, if you like. But that actually happens through every cell in the body. And that, that's why I place an emphasis on, um, on what I call life energy or, or what Chinese philosophers call qi. We can feel that within our bodies. It's where fundamental consciousness enters into the body. And there, there are two important stages here. The, the first important stage is when matter comes into existence from uh, fundamental consciousness. And there is another stage when physical structures become internally conscious. And that's when they become complex enough to receive and canalize fundamental consciousness. So there is an essential difference between non-living physical forms and living physical forms. So the difference is that living physical forms are able to receive and canalize 
fundamental consciousness. And I, I'm presenting this as a, as a new approach, but essentially, of course, it's not a new approach. Um, maybe my, my variation of it is new. But I, I would suggest that this approach is one of the oldest philosophical approaches in human culture. Certainly, um, it goes back to Indian philosophy. There's a little known Indian philosophical approach called Beda Beda Vedanta. Um, it's not as well known as other forms like Advaita Vedanta. But, but Veda, Veda Veda Vedanta literally means difference and non-difference. So it suggests that material forms are of the same nature as Brahman, but they're not entirely the same as Brahman. They're not just projections or representations of Brahman. They have their own distinct form and identity. Uh, so that's similar to what I call pan-spiritism. And Veda Veda Vedanta uses, uses the metaphor like a fire and the sparks that arise from it, the sun and its rays, a father and his son. It will probably be more accurate to say mother and her son. But you get the idea that, you know, the living beings are of the same nature as Brahman, but they're not just projections or representations. They have their own identity, their own kind of ontological uh, form. So they're both the same, but not the same. They're different and non-different. But really, this uh, philosophical approach goes back to early human history. Um, about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called The Fall, which was largely about anthropology. And I did a lot of research into indigenous cultures around the world. And I found that every, I think almost every, or even every indigenous, indigenous culture, which I researched, had a term for spirit force. They had a term for some kind of universal spiritual energy. And they didn't mean, they weren't theistic. It was a non-personal, in most cases, it was a kind of impersonal spiritual force, which was the source of all things and which pervaded all things. So here are some of these terms are very tricky to pronounce. I wouldn't even pretend, pretend to pronounce some of them, attempt to pronounce some of them. But they all mean essentially the same thing. Anthropologists translated Wakan Tanka as the force which moves all things. The Ainu of Japan had a concept of Ramut, which translates as spiritual energy. In New Guinea, there was a concept of Imunu, which means universal soul. So all of these concepts refer to the same thing, basically, a universal, fundamental, spiritual force, which is, I think, is essentially the same as what I mean by fundamental consciousness. Later human groups seem to have lost awareness of this fundamental spiritual force, which is, I, I speak about that in terms of the fall. And I think um, there were lots of mythological representations of that in cultures around the world, such as the, the myth of the fall in the Bible. But I think this, this seems to have been an everyday reality to certain indigenous groups. It was a kind of a tangible force that they could sense, this fundamental spiritual energy all around them. But in later cultures, it became, it became part of mystical traditions, mystical or spiritual traditions. We can play a bit of a game here where you, you, have, to, you have to fit the concept to the, the tradition that it's related to. You can do that if you like, as I'm speaking. I sometimes do that with my students. It's pretty easy, really. But yeah, all, all of these concepts refer to some fundamental spiritual force. Uh, they're, they're obviously slightly different but the fundamental aspects of them are the same. Brahman from Hindu Vedanta philosophy. Brahman can be roughly translated as spirit. It's a universal spiritual energy with qualities of radiance and bliss. The Tao is slightly different. The Tao, but the Tao is also a universal fundamental spiritual principle. It's the essence of things, it's the underlying harmony of the universe. Dhammakaya is from Buddhism, obviously, has a similar meaning. Neoplatonic philosophy, uh, there was a concept of the one, which was also a kind of fundamental spiritual essence, which was the source of all material things. Mystical Judaism, mystical Christianity has similar concepts. In mystical Christianity, the Godhead was seen as the source of God. It was a, a kind of level of reality beyond God. Uh, Meister Eckhart was one of the mystics who put forward that, that idea, which obviously got him into a lot of trouble with the uh, papal authorities. But it's the same principle, that there is some kind of spiritual universal source that underlies the material world and also gives rise to the material world. And that's essentially the same as what I'm referring to.
But I think that, um, you know, as I suggested in relation to indigenous peoples, is it is actually it is actually possible to experientially sense and feel uh, fundamental consciousness. And that happens in mystical experiences. And there are a couple of quotes here from from my own research. Um, the first one is from a mystical experience where the person became aware that everything was made of the same stuff. The only word I could find to describe it was love. I felt immersed in a sea of love where everyone and everything were made of the same energy. <clears throat> the second quote is from a near-death experience where, as is quite common in near-death experiences, people become aware of a translucent light. And it's sometimes seen as the essential reality of the universe, sometimes seen as the source of all, all material things, the source of creation, as this person says. So he said, the white light was the source of all creation. I never dreamed I would see anything so beautiful. It was blindingly bright, but didn't hurt my eyes. It was the beginning where the universe started. And this is why mystical experiences, they almost always um, feature descriptions of unity and connection. There's a feeling that all things are interconnected, all phenomenal forms are part of some underlying reality. And also the individual feels that they are part of all things. You know, in Christian mysticism, the individual becomes one with God. Or, or in, in terms of uh, Hindu philosophy, Atma, the Atman, the individual spirit becomes one with Brahman. And that's because, you know, essentially, at the most fundamental level, there is only oneness, there is only fundamental consciousness. And it is possible to experience that in mystical experiences. And I think in these experiences, people also experience some of the qualities of fundamental consciousness. They experience the nature of fundamental consciousness. And that's why people often speak of radiance or translucence dynamic creativity of, of, you know, a very powerful energetic quality, incredibly dense and powerful energy, and also feelings of bliss or love. So I think you could say that these are possibly qualities of fundamental consciousness. So I mentioned before, right at the beginning, that um, this fundamental consciousness becomes our own individual consciousness. It is uh, essentially of the same nature. And that happens through the brain, as I described earlier. I think that's the one of the functions for the brain. The brain obviously has a lot of uh, other functions. And those other functions come into being once fundamental consciousness is canalized into an individu individual being, then the brain works to organize fundamental consciousness so that it becomes our own individual minds with psychological structures and processes. So there's a difference here with filter theory. There's, a, there's this idea in, in filter, filter theory that the role of the brain, or one of the roles of the brain, is to kind of block universal consciousness, to stop us being overwhelmed by it. But I suggest that, you know, actually the role of the brain is more of a kind of productive or of a transmissive nature. It doesn't block universal consciousness, but it channels it into our own indiv individual beings. And that's why I think there is a relationship between physical complexity and consciousness and evolution. As you move through the evolutionary process, you gain, you know, you, you come upon more complex physical forms, more variation in physical forms, but you also come upon more intense consciousness. More complex physical beings are also more conscious. And that is because, you know, they, they have more cells and cells are more interconnected, more organized. So they can actually canalize fundamental consciousness more intensely. So I think that can help to explain this correlation between complexity and consciousness. I only have a couple of minutes left, but just before I finish, I'd just like to mention some of the explanatory power of panspiritism. I think that's one of the reasons why it has a lot of, um, you know, um, a viability or validity as a metaphysical, syst metaphysical system, because it has a lot of explanatory power. That's one of the things I mentioned in um, my book, Spiritual Science. I go through a lot of these areas describing how fundamental, how panspiritism can make sense of them. So I mentioned before that... Um, Physicalism can't explain human consciousness. I don't think it can explain it, altruism or the influence of the mind or the, or the body over the body. But I think all of these things can be more satisfactorily explained through panspiritism. Let me take the example of altruism. So physical, physicalist scientists 
they kind of, you know, they, they go to extreme lengths to explain away altruism. They go to extremely convoluted lengths to explain it. <clears throat> they suggest that altruism is a kind of disguised egoism, disguised self-interest. They explain altruism in terms of kin selection, uh, or reciprocal altruism. But the, I don't think these, um, these explanations can explain the full extent of human altruism. They can't explain why, why we are willing to sacrifice or endanger our own lives for one another, or, or why we are willing to help animals who are not genetically related to us or closely related. But if you think in terms of panspiritism, if you think of the idea that we share the same essential consciousness as all living beings, as I showed hopefully during the meditation, then altruism begins to make sense because we share the same consciousness so we can sense other people's suffering. And when we sense other people's or other living beings suffering, we feel an automatic impulse to alleviate their suffering. So you could say that empathy gives rise to altruism. And the only real way to explain empathy, in my view, is in terms of a shared fundamental consciousness. I love the, uh, the quote from Schopenhauer about, about this, from the German philosopher Schopenhauer, who ironically wasn't a very altruistic person himself, but uh, <laughs> he was quite a nasty person by all accounts. But anyway, he gave a very good explanation of altruism in his essay on the basis of morality. He said, my inner being exists in every living creature as truly and immediately as in myself. This realization is the ground of compassion whose expression is in every good deed. So you could express this in terms of, essentially, there is only one consciousness. And therefore, when, when any being within this one consciousness experiences suffering, then we have the capacity to sense their suffering and to take action to alleviate it. And also we have the impulse to, to connect with other people because we are fundamentally connected and therefore we feel the impulse to strengthen or reinforce that connection through empathy and altruism or compassion. And just before I finish, I'd like to mention that this perspective also offers ex an explanation of spiritual experiences or awakening experiences, as I like to call them. Awakening experiences can't really be explained, I don't think in physicalist terms, they can't really be explained in terms of aberrational or unusual brain activity. And the, there's been a lot of research into the correlations between spiritual experiences and brain activity, but the picture is pretty inconclusive and in some ways it seems to be inconsistent. But if you think of spiritual experiences as experiences of connection, experience, experiences of connection with our fundamental consciousness, that can occur in a state of deep meditation in which mental activity is quiescent, or it can occur in, in a state of um, quiescence in natural surroundings where we feel the connection or the interconnection of all life forms. We feel con uh, universal consciousness present within the world itself. So mystical experiences can be inward or outward, but essentially they are experiences of connection with fundamental consciousness. But as I say, um, you know, this is a speculative metaphysical approach. I'm not saying that it's uh, correct, but I'm filling in the details. There are certain problems that need to be uh, focused on, like the, the problem of how matter arises from fundamental consciousness is obviously quite a big issue. And also the question of how the brain receives and transmit, fu transmits fundamental consciousness is also a bit of an issue. <laughs> a bit of an issue is probably putting it mildly. But I think, you know, if you... You know, if you focused on the idea that the brain acts as a transmitter of consciousness rather than a well, rather than a producer of consciousness, then that approach could give rise to a more fruitful, um, you know, a more fruitful and coherent picture. People have been focusing for a long time now on the brain as a producer of consciousness, but it's not really led to any successful outcomes. So maybe if we think of the brain as the receiver and transmitter of consciousness, that will be more productive. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Steve. That was uh, 
very interesting indeed and a very clear exposition of the basis of your ideas. Um, and thank you also for the meditation. I was getting quite tired and I was ready for a little break, so that <laughs> did me good. Um, I'd like to open up this for questions to the other uh, speakers, but also to the audience online. Um, and we have a question from Vidushi who asks, Steve, what do you mean by consciousness in terms of pan-spiritism? Do you mean that everything around us has experience? Is there any overlap with information integration theory? That's an interesting question. <clears throat> Not really. What I mean is that um, if you think of fundamental consciousness as the essential reality behind all things, the essential reality and the essential source of all things, so it's, uh, fundamental, fundamental consciousness generates matter or generated matter when the universe began and, and therefore it pervades all material things. All, ma all material things are pervaded by fundamental consciousness at the same time as being products of fundamental consciousness. But only complex forms can have experience. So I would say that experience only comes into being once life comes into being, which is when um, cellular forms become capable of trans receiving and transmitting fundamental consciousness. So there is a se an essential difference between non-living things which are pervaded with fundamental consciousness and living things which have fundamental consciousness as their interior nature. Yeah. So you're equating it more to the structural complexity of the physical physical form than you are to the computation, uh, the computational uh, complexity. Yeah. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. That clarifies that. Henk has a question. Henk. I think you're muted. Hank. Yes. <laughs> Common problem. Now better? Yes. Uh, that there are a lot of problems if you want to reduce consciousness to matter. I agree. Then Pete Hutt and somebody else have the so-called the heart problem upside down. In your theory, how can you explain that the outer world is so <coughs> persistent? The outer world is so persistent? Yes, I mean, uh, when I go out and tomorrow, the streets are more or less the same. Well, the outer world, you know, I'm not saying that the material world is an illusion. I'm saying the material world is produced by, it was pro in, originally produced by fundamental consciousness. If you imagine that material, fundamental consciousness generates material particles and because fundamental consciousness has a dynamic quality, it impels physical structures to become more complex. That's the, you know, the uh, imp impetus behind evolution. So o over time, over millions of years, billions of years since the beginning of the universe, there's been this process whereby physical forms have become increasingly complex, but they are real. And they, they are permanent. They're just um, originally emanations of um, uh, fundamental consciousness. And at a certain point, when living beings become complex enough, sorry, when life form, sorry, when physical forms become complex enough, complex enough, they have the capacity to receive fundamental consciousness into their own being. And then evolution continues, you know, in, in, in life forms, which also become increasingly complex over time, because there is this dynamic creative quality within fundamental consciousness. Okay. But then the material world? Sorry? I didn't hear you speaking so much about the material world. Why is that so stable? I don't see why it shouldn't be stable. The material world is real. It is permanent. We're just talking about the source of the material world, really. The material world, there's no reason why it shouldn't be stable. Uh, my, my answer to Hurt would be that also the material world is subject to change, but then over a longer time scale, so that there is no mm. fundamental problem there. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Um, we have another question online from Aniga, and she asks, what you said in the beginning, Steve, about consciousness sounds very similar to the concept of the floating man by Avicenna in the 10th century. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not familiar with it. I'll, uh, no, me either, so I can't help you. Before I'm looking into it. it. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch it. Could you just say the name again? The, the concept float, of 
The Floating Man by Avicenna in the 10th century. Has anybody else heard of that, of our speakers? No. Sorry, we, Anika, we can't answer that one, but we're looking I'll, into I'll, it. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, any of the other speakers got a question? Bernardo. Uh, hi, Steve. I was going to ask you one question, and then you gave an answer that triggered another. So I'll briefly <laughs> touch on both questions. Uh, if the material brain or the material body uh, is what canalizes or channels uh, or, tra or receives uh, uh, consciousness, then is there an ontological distinction between the brain and consciousness? In other words, are you proposing a mm. form of ontological dualism? And if not, if it's a monism, how do you account then for this operational duality between a transceiver and that which is transceived? And the other question was, uh, you said, uh, well, consciousness permeates the world, but it only translates into experience when in some way uh, uh, channeled by a, a complex physical system. And then mm -hmm. the question would be, what is then consciousness in the absence of experience? Well, um, consciousness in the absence of experience is an impersonal force, uh, an impersonal kind of dynamic uh, radiant force which pervades all, all the universe and which gives rise to the universe. And, and individual consciousness is essentially of, this, of the same nature. But obviously, when it becomes canalized into our own being, it becomes diluted, it, it, it arranges itself, it becomes, it constitutes, it arranges itself into psychological structures and functions. And therefore, we become alienated, or we can become alienated from fundamental consciousness. I think that's one of the basic problems in human life, in human experience, is that we are alienated a lot of the time from fundamental consciousness. I think one of the aims of meditation is to regain contact with fundamental consciousness as it manifests itself in us. In a sense, we can never lose contact because it, it, is, it is us, it is us. But on an experiential level, we can become alienated from it. Um, but yeah, to go back to your first point, yeah, I mean, yeah, it could be seen as a kind of dualism. But I think of it in terms of Beta Beta Vedanta was originally seen as an attempt to, uh, to, to try and inter integrate monist philosophies and dualist philosophies. So I would suggest if it's po at all possible mm. that it's somewhere between monism and dualism. <laughs> um, but one, one way to conceive it is that... Um, I use the metaphor, in an article I wrote recently, I use the metaphor as a, of a sponge. Not the sponge that you have in a bath, but a real sponge in the ocean. So a sponge is, well, imagine that a sponge, well, sorry, a sponge is pervaded with water, obviously. On a physical level, it's pervaded with water. So in the same way, a living being is pervaded, the matter of my body is pervaded with fundamental consciousness. And at the same time, I am immersed in fundamental consciousness in the same way that sponge is immersed in water. And a sponge is a life form. So at the same time as being immersed in water and being pervaded by water, it has an inner being. Um, so the, the, there's those three things. There's uh, immersion, pervasion, and inward sentience, if you like. Those are the three ways in which fundamental consciousness manifests itself. So we're all like sponges in water. You know, obviously, physical things only have two of those. A physical, a physical entity, such as a sponge in my bath, which is mm. slightly different, only has two of those things. It's immersed in water and pervaded in water, but it doesn't have that inward consciousness as well. Okay. So hopefully that makes some sense. Thank you. Yes, it sounds like your, um, what you're talking about is similar to the concept of aliveness that Andreas Weber has, uh, has introduced recently, where he says that for all alive beings, they have this inner sense of what it is like to be alive. So we might not be able to know what it is like to be a bat, but we have in common with the bat that we know what it is like to be alive. Mm.